As soon as the panelists stop fighting, I'll get started. Yeah. Now that I have uh, Mary Lynn with a mouthful of water. All right. Well, welcome back after lunch. Uh, usually that is that enviable spot uh, that everybody craves, but I've got a great panel here that's going to keep you uh, engaged for the entire time. And I'm going to turn it over to Marty Frederick, who has been on my planning team and has uh, been a very vocal member of my planning team. And it's finally, we finally got to meet today, so exactly. I'm going to turn it over. Marty, uh, Corporate Director uh, for Northrop Grumman, and I'll let you do the introductions from there. Thank you. All right. Uh, is this thing on? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chris. And it has been a pleasure to be on the planning committee this year. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Really good group. Uh, worked very hard. So I am Marty Frederick. I'm a corporate director for Civil Space Programs with Northrop Grumman Corporation. I work in our Falls Church corporate office. Uh, my boss uh, is interested in space policy, and as Admiral Ellis would say, that makes me absolutely fascinated in it. So. I'm really glad to be here. I've got uh, three uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, you probably see in your program that we had four. Uh, we're going to be deviating a little bit. Uh, Mike, Mike Bevan, senior policy advisor with the National Space Council, he's had to wave off and uh, uh, to address some important activities back in DC. So uh, he sends his regrets and we'll miss him being here. But uh, the show must go on and we have some agile panelists uh, ready to handle the change. So. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so when the Symposium Planning Committee was uh, considering the agenda, we looked at the topic of space policy as broad and interest interesting topic, so broad and interesting in topic that we felt we needed two panels to cover it. The one panel before lunch was the FACA panel, very much tied up into uh, the policy aspects of it and uh, uh, how uh, policymakers and uh, uh, others are getting their information and how the dialogue is being shaped. So uh, that's all very important in the space realm these days. Uh, this panel is intended to look at space policy drivers. Uh, the current policy formation environment in Washington, D.C. is, in a word, um, non-intuitive. We'll say that uh, this panel uh, is going to focus on the challenges associated with this unique environment coupled with the diverse perspectives across the national security, military, civil, uh, commercial, international uh, space domains. Uh, on the current state of space policy, I, I, I look to uh, National Space Council Executive Director Dr. Scott Pace. He's uh, publicly stated the current administration's policy is actually very simple. Bigger, higher, farther, faster, now. So with that as the lead in, I'm going to turn this over to, I'm going to start at the other end and work our way back. So Eric. If you can uh, lead off for us, Eric is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. CSF is the largest trade organization dedicated to promoting the development of commercial space flight, pursuing ever higher levels of safety, and sharing best practices throughout the industry. CSF has worked tirelessly to develop industry standards and craft the modern Commercial Space Launch Act and encourage further growth in the commercial space flight industry. Before his uh, position at CSF, Eric served as Vice President of Government Relations at Analytical Graphics Inc., AGI, and he came to AGI from the Space Transportation Association, and he also worked on Capitol Hill in the office of then Congressman uh, Tom Coburn. And Eric, could you lead us off? All right. Make sure, make sure I'm hot and everyone in the back can hear me. Uh, I asked that once at a, a speech I was giving if uh, if everyone in you know, the room can hear me and a couple of people in the back raised their hand uh, and said they couldn't. So everyone in the front went, went to the back. So, uh. Uh, so I always got to be, be a little leery of that. And I also, there was a reference to Jeff Faust uh, and the great work that he does uh, in, in quoting us in real time. So I was wondering if Jeff Faust is here and if I'm going to get quoted in real time. And if he's not, then, then the, the floodgates are open of, uh, of just free, free flowing uh, conversation. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here, and I, I thank Chris and the, uh, the organizi organizing committee to have us here. I think there's so much going on in Washington uh, in, the, in the realm of space policy, and so much that has been going on in the last few years, it's kind of hard to keep up with everything. Uh, the last panel, uh, Mike Gold, who is always entertaining to listen to, and you can even learn something every once in a while from him, um, <laughs> 
uh, he, he had a, a, a fun picture, uh, you know, just titled FACA Fun on these, all these advisory committees. And it's really been a, a great honor for me to, to, be, to serve on a few of these on the Comstack and, and also the, uh, the user advisory group with Mary Lynn. Uh, we, we've become kind of a, a road show together, you know, like a, um, a stair, you know, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. We don't do any dancing, but you know, we're always together. Right. Um, so it, it's been great. And I think we're learning a lot from our, our different uh, constituencies and, and what, we're, what we're really realizing is that we have a lot more in common than we have, you know, kind of, uh, opposing so uh, so that's been a great thing and, and it's great to be here with Doug who um, uh, there was just a great job opening in Washington uh, as of yesterday uh, for uh, the National Security Advisor um, so I'm sure Doug, Doug's probably you know right in line as they go down the list uh, you know really one of the most qualified people uh, and it's a short-term gig so uh, you know, just, uh, just keep it in mind Again, Faust isn't here, so that would be one that would, that would get me there. Uh, as I said, there, there's, there's been so much going on um, in, in the space policy world, and, and it's, a lot of it's been driven, uh, I'm not saying all, but a lot of it's been driven by the, uh, the uh, engaged enthusiasm of the White House, uh, the President, especially with the Space Council, uh, on these space policy directives. Um, one of the ones, and, and there's, there's so much for us to talk about today, and I don't want to get bogged down in anything, but one of the ones that we really got engaged in and, and really involved, and I think it really energized the community, was the, uh, this recent NPRM, uh, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, that came out of the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And this, this really became quite a third rail in our community, um, and, and not an exciting third rail, uh, as long as you don't get, you know, I guess, electrocuted. Um, but the, the rules that, that kind of uh, govern or legislate um, uh, space launch haven't really been updated in over 20, 25 years. So as we, we did, took this closer look and a deeper dive uh, into the, uh, you know, these proposed rulemaking changes, it really got quite a bit of uh, folks from all aspects of industry engaged and involved, and uh, which is a great thing. So it was a lot of dialogue um, between the companies and between uh, certainly the FAA, who was uh, at the forefront of this. And it, it really kind of highlighted the beauty of sausage that everyone, well, most everyone loves sausage. It, it, of course, though, you don't like to watch it being made. But, you know, we were really at the, the outset at, at, at the factory floor of, of making the sausage um, and the, the dialogue that went into this, um, this, this rulemaking. It started off with an ARC, uh, this Aviation Rulemaking Committee, and how these rules should be looked at. Our organization was really looking at updating these, uh, the, the, the rules regarding the launch side of the house and also how it regulates um, spaceports. And then, you know, the dialogue as the, this quiet pe period as the FAA really, um, really put their shoulder to it uh, to get these rules out, uh, this, these proposed rules, in a short amount of time, I think less than, less than a year, actually it's about 10 months to get that out, and then to receive all the comments from industry. Some positive, some negative. Uh, you know, here's what you got right. Here's what uh, we think you missed the mark on. Uh, and then that that th the process of the dialogue on on how they they interact with industry. So, uh, you know, at times, what we, as we should be, we were a little critical of it. We thought there there were some shortcomings, uh, and we voiced that through the, the appropriate cha uh, channels. And I and I think we're seeing headway. And I see that in a lot of areas. I see that the Department of Commerce uh, and the efforts that they're having in reforming the uh, uh, remote sensing rules, uh, as well as with NASA. You know, as NASA's moving forward this very bold vision, uh, how, do we, um, how do we achieve this vision uh, in a cost-effective cost way and in a really efficient way? So, uh, and, and getting everyone involved uh, with this excitement. So I'm gonna leave it at that and we can talk a little bit more, but you know, those are some of the, uh, the hot button issues that we've been dealing with and, uh, and I think makes for an exciting time to be in space policy. All right, well, thank, thank you, Eric, that's uh, excellent. Uh, let's, let's turn to uh, Doug Levero. Uh, Mr. Levero is a highly regarded senior DOD space thinker and leader. Uh, he most recently served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy before uh, uh, forming the uh, uh, Levero Consulting Corporation, LLC. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, <laughs> uh, so in this role uh, at, um, uh, in space policy, uh, he was responsible for establishing policy and uh, guidance to assure United States and allied warfighters war uh, the, benefit, uh, the benefits of space uh, capabilities and helped guide the department's strategy for addressing space-related issues. He also led the departmental activities in international space cooperation. Prior to that, uh, Mr. Levero served as the executive director of Air Force Space Command's Space and Missile, Missile Systems Center, where he also served as the Air Force's deputy program executive officer uh, for space, overseeing every major DOD space effort. In addition to the assignments above, he's also directly managed multiple DOD and national reconnaissance uh, space programs, such as US GPS, uh, US uh, Future Space Imagery uh, Architecture Program. Uh, he left uh, the government in uh, 2017. Uh, he has a, a long list of awards and accomplishments and degrees, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Marty. Um, you didn't tell me we were supposed to come with our stand-up routine, uh, so yeah, Eric you, obviously you us all ten and, minutes and, and I did uh, not. Um, so I, apolo I apologize for that. I also I missed the uh, FACA panel, so I missed the Mike Gold show. Um, so uh, I'm pleasure. really it's yeah, I'm really here. upset about uh, about here. that. Um, let me uh, let me jump right into uh, some some things about uh, a policy that I that I really think uh, we should uh, we should talk about today, and hopefully. Um, we get a lot of questions um, today because I think that's going to be the most important and, e and interesting part. But Marty um, began the, um, the discussion here talking about three kinds of policy. He talked about uh, national security policy, he talked about commercial space policy, and he talked about civil policy. And, and Marty, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but as if they're three different things. Yeah. Um, and Good to point. me, they are not three different things. They are one thing in the same. They may be three sides of the same three-sided coin, which I have yet to find, um, but, uh, but they are one and the same thing. They go hand in hand. I often remind people, you know, in the, in the U.S., we don't have something that is called um, maritime defense policy and then maritime commercial policy and maritime civil policy. It's all maritime policy. Uh, and it's built, of course, on hundreds and thousands of years of tradition on the sea. Um, similarly, in the air, we have uh, decades and decades of policy. Um, on space, we've never really attacked this as a unified whole, save at the national level when the president issues his space policy and tries to put all three of them together in one policy. The first uh, U.S. national space policy was actually written by President Eisenhower uh, back in 1958 um, and encapsulated these three sides of the policy debate, but all in one policy to try to show that they were coordinated. Over time, they became less and less coordinated as different forces pushed um, decisions that were regulatory in nature, as, as uh, Eric just uh, talked about, or national security in nature, and we forgot that they are a unified whole. They really do complement one another, and, and, let me, um, and let me illustrate that point for you uh, by telling you a story that happened to me two years ago. Two years ago, the UN invited me over to a conference in Geneva um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, and the Outer Space Treaty, if we really look at it from back in 1967, uh, is um, really the fundamental <laughs> policy that guides almost everything we do in space. Whenever we pass US national law, we always have to be, um, be cognizant of the treaty uh, commitments that we sign because under US law, treaty commitments trump national law. Uh, and so. Um, we have to always uh, recognize that. And I was at this conference in the UN and all the conferees were congratulating themselves on 50 years of peaceful space and pointing to the, to the treaty as the thing that created 50 years of peace in space. Uh, when it was my turn to get up after a day and a half listening to the Russian delegation and the Chinese delegation and all the other delegations um, on, on this, I, I said, you know, we haven't had 50 years of peace in space because of a outer space treaty. Um, in fact, we've had 50 years of a contest in space that's included national security. None of us have found it in our interest to go ahead and actually um, do harm to one another in space. Um, it's not because a treaty prevented it. If that were true, there would have never been a war in the past 1,000 years. Um, so, uh, but I also chided them because they were still celebrating what they did 50 years ago and they hadn't done much since uh, in terms of national policy. 
and yet the entire state of play of space had changed. The policy in 67 was basically written by three countries, uh, the US, the Soviet Union, and the UK, and the UK was really there to go ahead and add some legitimacy to what the two other countries were doing. Um, eventually signed on, of course, by hundreds of countries. But those, those, those folks wrote the rules, and they wrote the rules to be in their, to their advantage. Uh, they wrote the rules to allow um, for war fighting in space. Uh, many people say that the treaty um, only permits peaceful uses of space. That's absolutely incorrect. It, permit, it only permits peaceful uses of the moon and other celestial bodies, but all hell can break loose in the spaces between. Um, and, uh, and that's allowed by the treaty because um, those two countries were using space for military purposes. But the treaty didn't recognize there's going to be a huge commercial industry that might have commercial interest in space. The treaty didn't recognize that there's going to be more than just two or three players in space. There's going to be 60, 70, 80 nations playing in space. The treaty didn't recognize that there would be a time in the future where we might want to think about mineral rights on the moon or asteroids as a real thing as opposed to as opposed to some imaginary thing in a Jules Verne's novel, which is what it looked like in 1967, but a real economic, economically viable concern that we should care about. And in fact, the only thing the UN um, wanted to argue about is whether or not they wanted to pass another treaty called the, um, um, the, the Treaty to Prevent an Arms Race in spa Outer Space called Paros, uh, which they've been arguing about since 1984 and have made no progress on or the Treaty to Prevent Weapons Placement in Outer Space, the PPWT, by the, by the Russians uh, now introduced, or other treaties that had to do solely with national security uses of space. And my comments to them was the, the policy vacuum in space, and I don't mean to, have to uh, uh, be rhetorical, <laughs> but the policy <laughs> vacuum in space is so much richer and so much more in need of change in the economic and civil realm than it is in the national security realm. Um, that that's what we really should be concentrating on as an international and a national community. The conference was shortly, either, either shortly before or shortly after the con U.S. Congress passed an own a mineral ownership rights uh, bill. I think that was back in 2017. 2000. Was it or 2018? 15, at the end of 2015. Yeah, yeah, so right after that. So the U.S. had already passed a law that basically said we're not going to go ahead and abide by the treaty, although the Congress, if you read it closely, also, also told the State Department to go out and negotiate how we could make that law actually legal in an international realm, the State Department failed to do that. And so I was able to yell at our State Department as well as the State Department of other nations as well for failing to do what we really need to do, which is we need to go ahead and start to talk about international policy, rules and regulations, norms of behavior that create opportunity for civil and commercial space. And at the same time, just as in maritime law, will serve us well in our national security realm uh, because these are three interrelated things. La we will never be able to reach agreement with the Russians and the Chinese, much less, much le much less many third um, world nations, on national security rules for space that are focused solely on national security. We will reach agreement with many nations in the world on things that help us all commercially to go ahead and compete in this vast, in this vast expanse, um, that that we are really at the at, at the very edge of entering, um, called space, and what it will mean for us economically in the future. I went back to the UN two years later, which was just this past March. Um, they still hadn't made any progress, uh, which was um, obvious uh, to me. Uh, but I began to talk to some folks about, you know, maybe just a subgroup of us should get together and make progress. If nobody, if the in, entire world c uh, can't. Amazingly, many, many nations actually want to make some real progress, even if it's outside the auspices of the UN. And I reminded folks at that conference that ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, started out as a non-UN organization with 55 nations. Now, there were more than 55 nations in the world back in 1944. Um, but only 55 had to come together to create the rule set that basically spurred international aviation and all the economic benefits that occurs, that have occurred and accrued to us because of international aviation. So it's my belief um, that we need to go ahead and get moving in this regard, that the, the U.S. should lead in this regard, and that we need to start to lay out the rules of behavior for international work in space that are in our economic and civil interest and will serve us well in the national security realm as well. And with that, I'll 
conclude my opening comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's, uh, let's turn to uh, Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar. Uh, so Mary Lynn is the president and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, a diverse industry trade group supporting deep space human exploration, space science, and space commerce. Uh, she is a member of the Users Advisory Group of the National Space Council, as we heard earlier. She serves on the uh, uh, Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee uh, for the FAA and is a member of the Executive Committee of, of the Space Studies Board of the National Academies. She began her career here at UAA, uh, University mm -hmm. of Alabama Huntsville as a member of the faculty before joining the Boeing Corporation, where she managed the Mission Operations Group for the ISS. Uh, Mary Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you, Marty, um, and thank you for uh, to the committee for the invitation to be here, and to Marty for the invitation to be here. And it's always a uh, joy to share a panel with uh, esteemed colleagues such as Doug and Eric, and so really appreciate the opportunity to do that. And it's always fun for me to come to this conference because it is sort of coming home. This was my first professional gig out of graduate school. Um, I came and uh, did work both with the College of Engineering and the College of Arts and Sciences here. And uh, when is why I was here that Boeing first approached me and asked me to leave academia and join Boeing. And at the time, I wasn't sure I wanted to go join, as I put it at the time, a multinational conglomerate that builds a lot of weapons. Um, but um, they eventually won me over, actually sort of indirectly. Um, I, um, within about six months of being here, I was consulting over at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. And I, if over time, about five years, I figured out I was enjoying doing that work more. Um, then I was enjoying the academic work, and so I left and started the first of what eventually became four companies um, because I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, and, uh, and then eventually ended up as uh, working for Boeing in their mission operations group for station, which was a wonderful experience and has informed a lot of what's happened since then. Uh, a story there briefly for those of you that knew John Young. Um, Captain Young wrote a infamous memo, which Wayne may remember, which actually had to do with uh, space station training and what an utter disaster it was. And John was noted for his memos. Um, they were not short. They were not concise. They were extremely detailed. And there was no doubt whatsoever after he had read one exactly where he stood. And I was at work at Boeing and Jim Buckley, who had worked for John, actually directly in the astronaut office before Boeing had hired him, came in, thrusts this memo in my face and says, can you do anything about this? So to this day, I blame John Young for absolutely everything that's happened since then because I decided to try. I'm not sure if I succeeded, but I did start to try. And I'm still trying. So what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about um, the, the title of the panel I thought was really interesting, Space Policy Drivers. And I want to talk about some that have already been mentioned here, but also talk um, a little bit about a couple that haven't. Is Nick still in the room? Yeah, yeah you're there. OK, so let me just start by saying this. Congress. OK, now we're good. All right, so, um, so what I want to do is talk about what, what a lot is getting a lot of the press these days, OK, is obviously the activity of the administration, because it's so deeply engaged in trying to, first of all, develop um, policies that are more whole of government. And if they're not whole of government, they're at least more of government um, to try to look at a lot of the barriers that are uh, exist within agencies and, and NGOs and uh, other organizations that drive policy in the US government, try to knock those down and figure out where it is that we can leverage capabilities that have already been developed and then also make changes that need to be made to push the ball down the field, particularly with regard to commercial and civil space, but also national space policies, you know, with, um, with space Space Force. Um, so there's been a lot of, um, obviously, a tremendous amount of activity. Wayne, earlier in the panel on FACAS, uh, mentioned that there were a list of directives um, that came out that were uh, given to, well, essentially not just NASA, okay, but mostly NASA, okay, given to NASA that it was supposed to execute on the last 60 to 90 days. And I refreshed myself um, as we were sort of going into lunch to remind myself what they were. And they're broad reaching. Um, they go over everything from civil space, like how are you going to go do Artemis? Um, and to commercial space, how are you going to make the best use of that? To international partners, how are you going to make the best use of international partners? And they're really trying to pull on both at the same time. What's interesting about the way they're written, if you go read them, is there a combination of directive to sort of come up with some sort of NASA's perspective with regard to policy, but also an implementation plan. Um, not 
deep, okay, but something of that um, at the same time. And so they're, 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 they're pretty complicated, and I wish NASA well. 60, 90 days to do a lot of this work is a, is a tremendous amount of work. Um, it's worth reading. You can go pull them up on the National Space Council site if you want to go see, which is actually over at the Office of Space Commerce, okay, if you want to see, okay, what those directives are. So fast and furious coming out of the National Space Council, we can tell you as members of the UAG, also um, it has looked from the outside as though we haven't been doing a lot, but we have. Um, Eric and I have been co-chairing a subcommittee, a committee on um, economic development and industrial base, and there's five other committees. Um, and all of those committees have been meeting and essentially trying to bubble to the surface issues that need work so that we can eventually move forward with recommendations. Um, or observations uh, that will sort of be passed back up to the Space Council. So that's all happening, and you'll see a little bit more of that, I think, um, later in the fall when there's a, there'll be another public UAG meeting that, that hopefully will bring some of that stuff forward. At the same time that the administration is rolling forward with all this thing, we have this co-equal branch of government called Congress, which is on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And because of what I do for a living, I frequently get phone calls from staffers, and I'm, I know Eric does too, I'm sure Doug does too, okay, asking me um, in various ways, what the hell? Okay, um, sometimes it's, it's uh, gee, could you tell us a little bit more about such and so a thing? Um, at other times, it's like, wow, this is great. Can we understand a little more about, you know, kind of how it is that you're seeing it? And in some ways, it's like, can you explain, explain this to us? Um, and a lot of those conversations, it, some of it have obviously is driven in, by, on a partisan basis, and so we all know that. We're a sophisticated audience. Okay, we're aware of that. But some of that is really, I think, my own view is that Congress is reacting to the fact that it has a tremendously activist administration. Um, and it's still trying to get its hands around that. Okay, you know, what does that actually mean insofar as formulation of policy is concerned? In civil space, Congress had a path that they thought that everybody was on, okay, which was eventually going to yield maybe boots on the ground by about 2028. Now we're talking about 2024. I know, oh, by the way, there's all these other things associated with it. And then over here, there's wanting to do more work on commercial remote sensing, which everybody agreed, okay, needed to happen. And so that's one of those areas where things have been pretty well aligned and not so much, I mean, you know, there's little stuff that goes back and forth, but everybody agreed that that really needed to happen. Um, and there, so there's this push and pull, and that push and pull is historic. The founders created it that way, okay? There's a push and pull between these co-equal branches of government, but it's very interesting to be in Washington right now, okay, and be watching Congress, okay, react to sort of what's happening from an administration point of view um, and have to sort of pick its way through, okay, which of these priorities for the administration, do we want to make priorities for us? And obviously that has something to do with the interests of their constituents, but it also has to do with the fact that Congress evolves policy per, um, positions over time, right, um, which it, it sort of creates through legislation. And it's a much more, um, what's the word I want? I will say contemplative, you could say slow, pick your, you know, um, process. But it's one that has to con that does consider policy. I would say in a more deliberative stance, and so so there's this interesting tension that's happening right now, beyond all the usual tensions having to do with partisanship. Okay, that really have to do with just sort of the speed and, and the grasp that the administration's taken on on policy issues, and then how Congress is trying to deal with those. Um, the last sort of policy driver I want to mention, just at a very high level, is one that we don't talk about very much, but I do want to talk about it. Um, because I really want to lay a couple of things to rest. Social media um, is the thing that I want to talk about. It's in the public forum. Um, and there is a belief, space advocates, as you all know, have great passions. Uh, it's a passionate community. Uh, we care about all of this. Um, one thing I really caution people a lot on is that if you read the space, if you read space policy as it gets sort of built up in social media, and to some extent the real media, although I'll be honest with you, I think that with some exceptions, and Jeff Faust, who's, I mean, we should probably give him sainthood after the number of times he's been mentioned here in the last, <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, Jeff and some others, okay, who are really responsible um, journalists, okay, kudos to them, right, because it's hard to, to do this job and do it objectively and do it in a way that's very thorough. Um, Irene, who, who did a masterful job yesterday tweeting out the fire, okay, um, over at, in Japan, okay, that sort of now is postponed a, a cargo um, a shipment up to the ISS. Um, a lot of these people who are just do really great jobs, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not throwing stones at anyone, but 
I go up on the hill and I hear this from staffers, and I haven't asked Eric this question, but I'm sure they do too. Staffers are getting younger and younger, which is another way of saying I'm getting older and older, okay? Because it's pretty much really the same age that they've always been, but they're coming in and they're reading social media. A lot of them getting their news, okay, from social media. Um, and they're reading outlets that have not traditionally been associated with space that have ventured into space because it's become very popular what, with SpaceX and Blue and others, okay? And so they're reading a lot of that stuff and they're getting their news from that. And we at the coalition actually started a class um, for staffers, okay, which we started last year. Actually, Wayne came and gave a lecture. Dan Dumbacher came in and gave a lecture um, where we were just basically getting people who were um, the established experts in the community. Dan came in and talked about program management, systems engineering. Okay, Wayne came in and talked about his work in commercial space. Okay, we had people come in who were established leaders in the community to basically sit down and talk to these young people, okay, for, largely, all right, for an hour and a half, and then do Q&A, and the Q&A is probably the best part of this. And the reason that we started doing it was because I kept getting questions that were clearly based on what somebody had read in social media. So I would like to encourage everybody here to get educated on what the actual facts are. What Eric said earlier about we've got a lot more in common than we do separately, there obviously is gonna be competition in the industry. That's just a given, right? I mean, that's part of the, that's actually, in my view, one of the things that's wonderful about the American system. Okay, so there's obviously gonna be that, but become educated about the facts and do not hesitate to share those facts um, because there is such noise, okay, in social media and when it reaches the point where it's beginning to influence young staffers on the Hill, no, I'm not talking about Nick, okay, when he was there, okay, but others, all right, who, um, but others, so it's, it's, it begins to be problematic, right? And so I don't know that social media is actually driving space policy at this point, but it is driving a perception that it's driving space policy. And from that, it starts to get easier to just sort of go right, roll right over that. So, so it's just one that I want to raise, okay? I'm not sure if it's actually a driver yet. It's a question that I have. Um, but it's one that we've been concerned about that we started to try to essentially start a class, okay, to, to try to deal with some of that stuff. So I'll stop. Can I, can I give you a rip from the headlines sure. um, <laughs> that is driving social media that I had to deal with on August 20th? Um, an article titled, the government's plan to update the uh, update rocket launch licensing is pissing off the commercial space industry, <laughs> The Verge. Um, so you can imagine some phone calls that I got from that being the commercial right. industry. It's your fault. Uh, that is my fault. Yes. And although everything that I said was, we're working very closely with uh, AST on this, and we're you know trying you know everyone's coming together on these rules. It is pissing off the commercial industry. You don't get that in the Washington Post uh, as much or Space News, but um, online where a lot of people get their news, those are some of the story headlines. So. Right. Good. Very good. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm, I'm going to use a little bit of uh, moderator's license to ask the first question while everyone else is formulating their questions. Uh, I'm not sure we said space, national space policy directives explicitly, mm -hmm. uh, but there have, the White House has put out a few, it tends to put out a few more. Uh, that is part of what the Congress is having to react to, what the industry is needing to react to, and uh, Doug, as I think you pointed out, the international community is probably going to be reacting to that as well. How do you, how do you think that uh, uh, using space policy, policy directives as leadership tools in our community is working out uh, in the current environment? And uh, Whoever wants to go first, just uh, go ahead and speak up. I'll jump. I'll jump in because I'm never shy. Yeah. Um, I I think they're excellent. Um, you know, uh, a space policy directive is nothing more than a decision documented on paper. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really all it is. But the act of documenting it on paper and publishing it um, makes all the difference in the world. Uh, it is um, it is a statement of what um, at, at what the leadership of the nation has decided to do, and to, and to uh, Mary Lynn's point, it then creates a reaction um, on the other, in the other branch of government um, that has a say in those things, and sometimes those reactions are good, and sometimes those reactions, or, or I should say, sometimes the reactions are for it, sometimes against it, but regardless of for or against it, it creates a reaction, and reactions create progress. So um, if you just go ahead and give a speech, if you're a, if you're a senior executive and you're just in the, in the administration, and you just give a speech and you say, here's what I want to do, but it's not committed down to paper, well then it's just one of a, mil a million speeches that have been given. 
Um, but if at the end of the day you have a presidentially signed directive that says, here's, here's what I'm directing the apparatus of government to go do, uh, the Congress and the other elements of the, of, uh, the nation, both the commercial world um, and uh, the civil world, are forced to react and to take a stance for or against it in, su in support of um, accomplishing the, ob the objective and saying it's not due. And that conversation drives progress in, in no uncertain terms. And I, you know, if I look at the, the four um, SPDs that the, um, that the President has signed out, every one of them dr has driven progress. And, I will, and I'll share with you, several of them were things we were actively discussing when I was in space policy in the Obama administration. But we were, do we were doing those same discussions, the exact same discussions, with many of the exact same goals were happening in private, not in the public sphere, and therefore create less progress um, in my mind. Um, now, clearly there's a point to where you can issue so many proclamations that it becomes, it, it becomes um, the, the, the situation becomes too noisy and you can't really make, make progress, but that hasn't been the case. Um, we've had four space policy directors so far um, in the first three years of this administration, uh, and every one of them has been on a, a very high level issue that has to do with U.S. competitiveness in space, national security competitiveness, civil competitiveness, commercial competitiveness, and I think it's excellent. So I'm very much for them. I think, and I agree with everything Doug said, the only challenge is that we live in a very polarizing world. And, and, and I have applauded these, these four space policy directives because they're tangible. They are something and they're, they're marching orders, if you will. Um, but the reception that you get with, you know, um, a, a, an administration that is at times controversial, uh, to, to be, say it lightly, uh, I guess. And you get these, these directives that go over to Congress and, you know, folks on the other side know that they're, they're pretty sound and they, they really, but they just don't want to like it because of where it came from. And that impedes the progress a lot of times that I see of educating um, different, various members that just are adamantly opposed to the administration. Um, but we're saying, hey, but this is really good for business. This is something we all, you know, kind of agree on. And to bring them around on it, you know, I, I think to, you know, uh, Jim Bridenstine, as he was voted in as NASA uh, administrator, very accomplished person, qualified for the job, it's the president's discretion, and he got confirmed by one vote, mm -hmm. by one vote. There's convicted felons that did better uh, than him in the, in the confirmation process. Um, so that, Jeff, that just Faust, goes to – Faust, where are you? Okay, yeah. This is all off the record, right? I believe, I believe Eric said that Jim Bridenstine is worse than a convicted felon. See, Obama. that's social media. That's, <laughs> see, Doug is the problem. Yeah, he'll tweet that out on me. Um, but but that it, that's the, the, the challenge that we have in, you know, going up and educating. You know, um, you know Nick's old, old office, you know, the Senate Commerce Committee, when we go up there – we make sure that it, we're briefing the Republicans and the Democratic and the staffers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes, you know, with so many in the room, you don't know who's who, you know, who, who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. And I love that because they want to hear the no-nonsense, the unspun version of why this, this legislation is good or these regulations are good or why they're bad and how, how they can be helpful. So. Um, I would say I would agree with absolutely everything that, that has been said. Um, I would say that the devil is in the details, right? The, pur the purpose of the SPDs is to, I, I like that very much, that essentially it's a decision that's been put into a, a presidentially signed memo, basically, um, is, is what it is. And then how it is that you go about implementing that, and that's where it starts to get interesting because that's when Congress starts to get engaged, and the White House is also engaged, OMB is certainly engaged. Um, with regard to, I'll just talk about NASA, um, with regard to NASA, NASA is certainly engaged. I mean, some of these, the directives we referenced earlier, um, where they're having tried to figure out how it is that they're gonna execute some of these things by 2024. Um, and then after that, from 2024. And so one thing I would like to point out is that when you think about it from a policy point of view, a space policy directive is a directive. It sets direction. Um, it is not intended, okay, to basically necessarily drive out what all the details of the implementation are supposed to be. And sometimes I hear those things get confused, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 
um, it, it, it was said to do this by the Space Policy Directive. No, the Space Policy Directive said, okay, that we're going to reinvigorate the human spaceflight program, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to lay the framework to go to Mars, we're going to do that with commercial international partners, essentially what SPD-1 says, okay, we're going to do that in, in an innovative fashion. Okay, everything that comes after that, all right, is really the implementation, implementation plans that's going to get negotiated um, back and forth between all these different entities that are engaged, but it's important, I think, to sort of keep those things, understand what one is and what the other is. Excellent. Uh, Chris, we, I think we've got a uh, few minutes, right? Should we turn it over to the audience? Any questions? Any questions? Are, are the mics on? Yes, good. Yeah, the, Anybody? Oh, there's one up here. I need traveling music. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so I guess this question would be for uh, Mrs. Detmar. Uh, in regard to what you were speaking right now, um, I guess as simple as what would be, what are your recommendations for people to, I guess, get educated and informed uh, in space policy, so we don't go to social media and get like <laughs> juicy headlines. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, come to conferences like this, uh, where I think people are, are work really, really hard to try to get information out in front of people and engage conversations that tend to be fact-based rather than you know necessarily talking point, point driven. There's some of that, but essentially they're trying to get the facts out there. Um, I thought the exploration panel this morning was great. I mean, I love hardware. I miss hardware. I used to actually do hardware, believe it or not. Okay, and so when I see hardware, I get all excited. Um, it was really, it was good to sort of see that that progress being made. If you read social media right now about SLS and Orion, SLS is a paper rocket, okay? Orion is too heavy to be lifted by anything ever in the history of humankind. Right. Um, and essentially, we're not gonna be able to use these vehicles to do anything at the moon. Now, that's obviously one brand of social media that's very extreme, and I'm also being very extreme in terms of how I'm talking about it. But the material is actually out there, okay? I mean, you know, when it comes to commercial remote sensing, for example, if you want to go look at the Office of Space Commerce, there's a huge collection, okay, of, of data, okay, and previous policy work and drafts, and then there's a lot of that exists in legislation. I mean, part of the problem here is that to become educated requires work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to actually do the work um, and one of the things I, I fear for the country, the sort of loss of critical thinking that I see whatsoever, people are perfectly willing to sit around and let their televisions or their social media channels serve up to them what it is that they should be thinking about things. Come on, people. Citizenship requires work. Okay, and it's the same, it's the same way, okay, in, in space, all right, which is that you have to go do the work. But those sites are out there, just go Google NASA, Google the Office of Space Commerce, Google the FAA, um, Google, Google Congress, okay, find Nick, okay, I mean, do the, find George, okay, I mean, there's a lot of people, this room is full of people who have a tremendous amount of expertise in these areas. You know, you can tune in and listen to ASAP as it's going down, okay? You can tune into a lot of these, these deliberative bodies and these FACA by Thanks definition, Councilman. okay? Yeah. You can listen to FACA, okay, as it's, as it's going on. But you do have to do, you do have to do the work. Could I, uh, could I jump in there? Uh, I wanna say there's, uh, so first of all, I agree with Mary Lynn, you have to do the work, it's, it's critically important. Um, I also think there's something important for us to do, and that's to do outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so often we are so insular in what we do, we don't do outreach. I, I write a lot, I come to conferences like this to speak, I, um, but I, I appear on um, less um, scientific uh, shows as well. I was on something called Hotel Mars uh, the other day, a, a podcast um, that some of you may listen to, I never heard of it. Uh, they desperately wanted me to tell them how the Space Force was gonna be Starship Troopers on Mars. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they asked that question like four different ways and I just wouldn't bite on it. Um, but, but, the, but the point is, is that there is an audience out there that's, yeah. uh, that's hooked yeah. on social media. I view it just as much as our responsibility to go ahead and get the work out there. Yes, it's all available. You can go and, and, uh, on the websites, but let's face it, um, uh, the citizens today don't necessarily have the time nor the inclination to do so, and yet we still need an informed citizenry. Um, so I believe that it is one of our responsibilities as, um, as those of us who are uh, uh, learned or, uh, or at least have an inkling of what goes on um, in this community to share uh, in the way that uh, folks want to learn. Um, and so I almost never turn down a request for an interview 
Um, although my wife, who's also my CFO, asks me what I'm getting paid, and the answer is always zero. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless um, I think it's critically important for us to reach out and go on these go on these places which are less likely to have the truth presented, and actually inform the audience. And every time I've done that, I get reactions back. It's like I never knew that. That makes sense. I didn't make it didn't make sense to me before I listened to what you said. And now it makes sense, and that's and if there's only if I can only do that for one person at a time, that's that's worth it in every way, shape, and form. That's awesome. I agree. That's very good. Very, very good. Yeah, I think that's one thing on the UAG that they've been very much uh, encouraging us to do is to go out to the different conferences and and talk about and, and not a propaganda way, but in, in a, what what we're doing. Um, there's no script. Just you know, how are we involved? How are we moving the ball forward? What are uh, some of the hindrances that we're having? Uh, with the, some of these directives mm -hmm. and, and where they're positive and, and where they need some work. Mm -hmm. good, good. Hi, Eric, you touched on this a little bit, uh, but maybe all the panel can talk about this a little more. One of the advantages our, our industry has had in the past is it has been very nonpartisan, that the space support has been very good, broad across the aisle. But uh, are you starting to see that change, like you said, because of the Partis the, the heavy partisanship going on in Washington right now, is it, is it going to start hurting our industry in that people are going to start taking positions that are more partisan and less uh, friendly towards space in general? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think we always have, as, as you mentioned, enjoyed a, a very good bipartisan uh, spirit. And I, and I think on the committees that are relevant to us, um, you know, the Science Committee, you know, the uh, Commerce Committee, uh, of course, always the Appropriations Committee. Uh, you know, some of these, there's so, so much uh, turnover in the House and, and a little bit in the Senate, and it's this constant education process. I, I testified uh, last month or in July uh, on a, uh, a hearing that was basically Space 101, mm -hmm. you know, and what we should, you know, what, what are the issues and uh, what is commercial space and what do we need to know about it, things like that. And at first I was like, it's like, gosh, you know, do we really need to do this? But we do, because there are, there are members of Congress that just aren't educated um, on the issues. And, and not to bring too much levity to the, to the table, but you know, one of the, 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 uh, the ideas was, well, why do we need to do a gateway? Why don't we just tow the space station into a lunar orbit? Yeah. <laughs> of course. And I'm, That's a great I, idea. That's yeah, so, so I got these friends in Huntsville that might be able to help on this, um, but, you know, I didn't even know what to say, so I deferred it to Gerst, and, and later that day, he's gone, so. Um, that was your fault, too, obviously, yes. okay. Yes, that had nothing to do with the answer, um, but there, there, it's, it's the education process, it's getting to, it's, it's the relationships, everyone, you know, chides the special interest in Washington. I'm biased. I think space is a special interest. It's the most special interest. Um, and I think we need to get the, the message out on what we're doing, on the vision. That's not just this administration, but I think it's a national vision on what we should be doing. Um, I, th I, th I think I saw a statistic on one of those on social media. Like, do you, do you, uh, do you agree with uh, going to the moon in, you know, in, in five years? And it was like 83% agree that we should go to the moon. Yeah. So, I, I, man, but it, it's hard. There's 435 members of Congress um, uh, in the House that um, of that, maybe 35 to 40 really care about space and maybe are educated um, and just, you know, probably 10 percent of the Senate, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more. So um, but the work goes on mm -hmm. for sure. You know, I, um, I actually find um, that even in these days of hyperpartisanship, um, space and, um, and both national security space, civil space, commercial space, still tend to be mostly nonpartisan issues. Uh, and I'll, I'll point to perhaps the most partisan space issue that we're dealing with right now, or the one that has the potential to be most partisan uh, that we're dealing with right now, which is the creation of the Space Force, um, which, uh, which the President um, uh, directed. Um, and even in an issue that is so visceral um, and has so much negative press about um, the militarization of space, um, a, a Democratic House um, voted basically for the entire uh, bill the administration put forward. The Senate, I would comment, did not. Um, and uh, in fact, they're the ones who have to, who have to get back in line here. Um, but that demonstrates the lack of partisanship and the more, more trying to do what's right 
Uh, on that particular issue, I've spent the last three years uh, working with both sides of the aisle uh, and both houses of Congress. Um, it well before the president mentioned it um, and after the president mentioned it. And I found no particular change in the positions of the individuals on the subject regard, uh, whether from before the president mentioned it and after the president mentioned it. So, so I still find that there are areas like this, like space, um, that are nonpartisans. And I think, again, one of our responsibilities is to make sure space doesn't become partisan, is to make sure we don't try to appeal to one side of the aisle to gain advantage, either industrial advantage or um, programmatic advantage or whatever kind of advantages, that we, that we don't do that. Because the minute we start making decisions about space um, partisan, they will become so. Uh, we instead need to go ahead and appeal uh, to the higher angels and say this is the right thing for the nation uh, and carry through, and then um, explain why it is the right thing for the nation. Uh, I think, I, so again, I believe that's on us to go ahead and do. Yeah, I would agree. I, I'm not seeing much of a change um, over time. I do think we have to treat that bipartisanship tenderly and with great care um, and understand that it's a tremendous asset to us as a community and, and take the kinds of cautions that are being described here. Um, what I see more, at least on the congressional end, is a generational change. And I referenced it a little bit when I was talking about staff, sort of unfairly. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping some of my friends here will take some of that understanding how I'm in it. Um, but that's true also of members, right? We had a lot of members who came up through the Apollo generation and they sort of imprinted on Apollo. And so for them, some of this appears as self-evident in some ways, right? That the, we need to, the United States needs to remain engaged in space. But as you have younger and younger members coming on board, they don't have those memories. They didn't have that experience. Um, and so reminding ourselves that we need to continue to articulate things that may seem self-evident to us, but are not self-evident to people that are outside what I'll just call the bubble, um, I think that that's something that we also need to take very seriously and be certain that we continue to refresh that with policy influencers, that means people at think tanks as well as the media, okay, and then also those people who are, who are actually building the policy. And I think we just need to remind ourselves over and over and over again how important that is. Okay. All right. Thank you all for all of your comments. Um, but picking up on the social media uh, dimension, and since this is space, why don't we fight fire with fire um, is the context of the question, which is, um, using Hangouts, um, which is a social media context, of course, you know, virtual panel like this, that can reach far further um, than a, an in-person panel um, and be more enduring to address some of these challenging topic areas and areas where the, the community could be under-informed, like, say, nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that approach uh, to try to get, uh, get the word out more equitably? So. I think, I think Hangouts are great. Um, I, th I think because they allow for discussion and interaction in some ways that are different than like a 240 character tweet, right? Um, or even a tweet storm, okay, that's, that's still. Um, but there is so much noise. Um, from a communications point of view, my doctorate had to do with a thing called theory of signal detection, and I won't bore you to death, but part of it had to do with signal and noise, right? Um, how salient is the signal and how much is the noise? Um, and there's a tremendous amount of noise. There's more noise each and every day because there are more and more channels each and every day. So my view is the way to deal with that is first of all to really count on people who understand communications, um, who, who practice it for a living, um, and to engage them and continue to work with them um, in doing that kind of thing. But also make a use of all available channels. So Hangouts, okay, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter. I mean, you all, you all know what they are. but to the extent that we can kind of consolidate our messaging, right, um, which is one thing I think the SPDs also could be used for. They have really sort of said, here's where we're going on the middle of the road, these are the issues, or these are things that are high priority. Consolidating our messages sort of around all of that stuff and making sure that we could push that through all of those channels. Um, it's a tough job, uh, and, it's, and it's very difficult to do to rise above that, that noise level. Um, but I don't think we can stop, right, and I think we have to continue trying to do that. Yeah, I think one of the areas we have to do is is get out of our own echo chamber. Mm -hmm. as, as I say, you know, like, 
in my world, I, I, my friends are space people. I hang out with space people. I talk, you know, I go on panels with space people, and I think space is the best. Uh, and and I, I got a hard, wet sock to the face um, this, this past couple of years, ago, or about two years ago, I think or on or about February 6th of uh, uh, 2018, uh, with the Falcon Heavy launch. And that was eye-opening, not because it was a great, you know, technological achievement or the advancements by a, a private sector company, about how it's going to impact uh, or the impact that it had on the national airspace and the integration into the airspace. Mm -hmm. And the aviation community, who I just didn't give a whole lot of thought to, I mean, they got me here, and hopefully they'll get me back, um, but they, they, they took off the gloves. Yep. When it was a shuttle, no problem. You know, close all the airspace. When it national security payload, we have no problem. But you have a billionaire putting up uh, his uh, Tesla as this, this is a stunt, you know, uh, to test this technology. We've had it. And they, they really took off the gloves yeah. with us. And for the past two years, that has been my fight um, with the aviation community. And it's gotten better because it, it took a lot of communication. But, you know, they, um, th they have profits in mind. And we are impacting on their profits. And I, I'm just saying space, like everyone that launches. We launched 32 times. We had 32 commercial launches in 2018. Um, down in Florida, they're, they're shooting 50 for, they're going 50 for 50 or something like that. And um, it's only going to grow. And they're concerned about that. So we have to get this message out because, you know, you get headlines, another, you know, rip from the headlines. The next time your flight is delayed, blame Elon Musk. Thank you, Bloomberg, for that. Um, and so th they're getting the message out as well. So we have to tell a positive story, the impacts that, that space has, uh, the positive impacts that it has. Um, but getting out of, you know, just talking to other space people. I don't know if um, uh, if I can add uh, much to this. You know, you talked about doing panels like this on on Hangouts and, and other other uh, live stream kind of things, which several um, organizations do. John Logston, who got the um, uh, the award over lunch, um, uh, GW um, uh, does uh, often does those kind of live interactions things. I, I will tell you, um, I, I probably I'm just an old curmudgeon on this, um, but I believe there's a, uh, yeah I know no way. Um, but I believe there's so much um, uh, noise in the system, it's, it's um, maybe not worth trying to do that as a, as a main means of communication. For one thing, look, the fact of the matter is, is that 75% uh, of the country barely cares what we talk about in this room, and, right. we'll have, and, and they don't vote for their legislators on issues we're going to talk about in this room. So it really doesn't impact us all that much. I find every time I do something online, the number of people who misunderstand what we're talking about are far, far out number, by 10 to 20 to 1, the people who understand what we're talking about. And in fact, the stream of comments that come after that have, more, have far more negative consequence on the message than, the, than what I originally posted or originally may have said. And so I, I, I fear that danger. What I do love, and I, and I want to pick up on what Eric said, um, we do need to be showmen a little bit uh, the, to go ahead and get our message yeah. out. Uh, Elon Musk, for better or for worse, is a showman. And more people watched, um, uh, you know, um, Ziggy Stardust uh, uh, fly, flying the Tesla around and started to learn about orbitology uh, and the fact that, you know, the Tesla has finally made it its way around the uh, sun uh, one time and it's got the best gas mileage of any car ever invented in the history of mankind. That, that kind of showmanship actually works in social media, yep. where you can teach in a way that attracts eyeballs and doesn't attract um, trolling. Uh, and I think that's the key. And, and by the way, I think NASA, of all of the agencies that do space, the NRO tends to not be very socially media active. Um, I don't know why. Um, the president posted one of their pictures. I don't know why. Oh. Uh, um, so, um, so, um, uh, the you know I, I think the the fact of the matter is is that there there actually is um, there actually is some good uh, social media interactions where you can adopt a positive tone and teach people things um, that actually expand our bubble of individuals uh, and and I think that's to the benefit. I would hate to try to do something where we have a whole bunch of interaction back and forth. I, I find I find an exceptional amount of trolling on the space force kind of topics which I deal with a lot. There's probably a lot of trolling elsewhere. So uh, I do fear that reaction. 
But to, to, so just to bring that first circle, when I said I think you have to use all the channels, I do mean all the channels. I mean the written word. I mean, you know, you need to, people do actually put stuff on social media that reflects decent content because they've gone and found that content. So the written word, things that get published in online things that are really quality kinds of things, using all media. Um, but I do think you also have to be, to your points, I think you have to be very realistic about reach. Um, the polling data have not changed in 60 years in this country, not in 60 years, okay, with regard to the amount of interest among the public, okay, with regard to space. They haven't changed. They've been remarkably just rock solid stable. Um, it's a minimum, okay, of people that are engaged enough to sort of keep this whole thing going. And I don't think, I think, I think Musk is a great showman. Um, and I think that he's, I wish we actually have him to thank to some degree for the fact that there's all this sort of renewed interest in it. Um, but, but I do think that we, ha we have to keep on doing that communication and that engagement. We have to think about all those different channels that are available to us. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. Fun. Thank you very much, and thank you for Marty for assembling a great panel. Oh, thank you uh, for everybody's attention.